Hi, welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be the fifth one in a series on Martin Heidegger and more specifically on Martin Heidegger's most famous work, Being in Time. In the previous video what we did was we looked at Heidegger's treatment of death as part and parcel of his treatment of the temporality of being. Uh, and we more or less set up the topic for this video, which is going to have to do once again with death, but this time in terms of the care structure. Now remember, the care structure is the three-part uh, analysis of uh, part of what we are, being, uh, that Heidegger does in terms of facticity, fallenness, and existentiality. That's from a previous video. So what we're going to be looking at is his treatment of being toward death, which we looked at in the previous video, in terms of that care structure. Okay, so let's dig into it. And uh, so you already know more or less what's going to be coming in terms of the structure. So first, being toward death in terms of facticity. So the first thing to know is that death is part and parcel of Dasein's throneness. Okay, so here you have to remember back to the previous video where we were looking at uh, the care structure. And part of what we noticed about the care structure is this dimension of throneness, that we're thrown into this world is how I put it in the earlier video. So that in terms of uh, death and the dimension of death in our lives, uh, Dasein is, is a kind of thrownness into death. In other words, uh, we're thrown into a kind of existence that has as an integral part of it this reality of death. Okay, that's part of the givenness of things. Along with that comes a certain measure of anxiety. Okay, so anxiety is going to be a dimension of our thrownness into death, which in turn is a dimension of our facticity. Okay, so uh, let's see. Anxiety is a basic structure of existence as a consequence, um, and it's about, once again, the possibility of the impossibility of Dasein. And I said once again because we already uh, took up that kind of odd turn of phrase in a previous video. Okay, so when you connect all the dots to that, okay, so ultimately uh, we have a kind of anxiety about our mortality, uh, but our mortality is actually integral to what we are, that really what our anxiety is about is nothing less or more than existence itself, okay? So that's what makes us anxious, our existence itself. And so existence, as you might well imagine at this point, is a kind of ontological category, a basic dimension or constituent of what we are. Okay, so that's uh, the first one, and definitely the shortest one for sure. Now let's move on to fallenness, the second dimension of the care structure. Okay, so fallenness, remember, is uh, a way of talking about inauthenticity. So here we're going to be talking about uh, the inauthentic ways that we have of treating our mortality. And Heidegger outlines uh, several of them. So uh, I more or less summarize them for you in your notes. So three primary ways that we treat death inauthentically. Uh, first, uh, Dasman constantly invites us into the temptation to cover up from ourselves our own most potentiality toward death. All right, so we cover it up for the most part. And here, uh, you know, maybe it would be helpful to think about uh, you know, where death occurs within our culture. And for the most part, it occurs in places that are definitely out of the way in hospitals and uh, possibly hospice care and uh, that sort of thing. In other words, it's, it's not really a public thing. And you may think at first, well, okay, so yeah, probably most deaths occur in hospitals or places like that that are out of the way and out of sight, out of sight, out of mind. Okay, that's a way of describing, uh, you know, what Heidegger is talking about here with respect to covering up death. But you may think that, well, you know, yeah, but what about all the um, deaths that we witness on TV and uh, in video games, you know, especially if you're a first person shooter fan like I am in the world of video games. Boy, you, you rack up a pretty high body count after a while. And isn't that uh, a sort of ubiquitous way of viewing death. And uh, here the trick is uh, that's not really death that we're viewing when we see it in movies or we see it in video games or something like that. That is a kind of simulation of death, a kind of theatrical production around the theme of death, but that's very different from encountering death itself. All right, so when you see 
uh, a movie like, uh, you know, let's see, I'll try to think of a movie with a high body count, like Natural Born Killers or something like that, which seemingly has a huge uh, body count, uh, that's, you're not really present to death. In a way, you're very distant from death when you watch a movie like that because it provides a kind of uh, tranquilizing, that's going to be the next thing, a tranquilizing distance between yourself and the reality of death. So, uh, and that's why it's a form of entertainment because if, if you were re really encountering death, unless you're a sociopath, probably it's not going to be very entertaining to you and sociopaths are, relatively speaking, few and far between. Okay, so uh, the second one, I sort of mentioned it very quickly, uh, the, the they provides a constant tranquilization about death, both for the dying and the living. So we tranquilize, so the first strategy is we cover it over. Second strategy is we tranquilize ourselves about it. Um, and he says that, well, one form that this takes is the public acknowledgement that everyone dies. Now the rate, way in which that's tranquilizing is that it de-emphasizes the very personal nature of mortality. Okay, so when we say everyone dies, it seems like we are confronting the reality of mortality when in actuality we're e actually evading the reality of mortality in a tricky way by, by uh, sort of attributing it to a very amorphous and general um, you know, body of people that has to go through it. Well, the point of death is not that everyone has to die. The point is that you have to die. <laughs> okay, so that's that. the real, really confronting death is something personal. It's not something general. It's something very personal. So that too is a way of tranquilizing ourselves about the reality of mortality, even though at first it seems like we're acknowledging it. And the last one, the last one is probably, I think, a little bit rarer in our world, our 20th, first century world, than it was in the 1920s when Heidegger was writing this. So, uh, let's see, let me try to find it in your notes where he's talking about this so I can say it in just the right way. Um, okay, that they prompt this is a bit of blah, 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 blah. blah. Uh, hidden for view. Okay, okay. So, well, I can't find it in your notes, but here's here's what it is. It's uh, it's about uh, adopting uh, an attitude where uh, confronting mortality makes you seem like a coward. Okay, so um, you know, in other words, sort of like a like a uh, courageous uh, macho person doesn't really think about the issue of mortality. And, uh, you know, I suspect, I always suspected that this part of his analysis came from sort of the machismo of having been through World War I not too long before he was writing this and the kind of attitude that sort of real men had about mortality and what it is to confront mortality. I suspect that that's quite a bit rarer in our world these days, although probably it does happen from time to time. Okay, so quote, here it is in your notes, uh, and maybe this will give you a taste for a little bit of Heidegger's way of putting things, which is not always the most accessible in the world. I'm sure you, if you've watched the previous videos in this series, you probably already have a sense for that. So he writes, uh, in thus falling and fleeing in the face of death, Dasein's everydayness attests that the very they itself already has the definite character of being toward death, even when it's not explicitly engaged in thinking about death. Okay, so being toward death is always happening, whether you're focusing on it or not. Even in average everydayness, okay, that's a kind of code phrase for inauthenticity. So when he's talking about average everydayness, he's talking about the way that we normally are, and from his point of view, the way we normally are is in a mode of inauthentic existence. So even in average everydayness, this own most potentiality for being, which is non-relational and not to be outstripped, is constantly an issue for Dasein. And in other words, it's always there, whether you like it or not. This is the case when its concern is merely in the mode of a troubled indifference toward the uttermost possibility of existence. So when you think you're being indifferent toward death, it's still there, okay, this anxious relation toward mortality. And okay, so uh, so let's sum up uh, the dimension of fallenness, like fallen or inauthentic being toward death. We cover it over, we distract ourselves, we tranquilize ourselves, uh, we sort of adopt a 
sort of macho attitude of uh, courageous indifference toward death. And all of these ways are deflecting ourselves from the ultimate and overwhelming reality of our mortality. But I think the most interesting and worthwhile part of this analysis is the third part. So the third part, of course, if you watch the previous videos, is going to have to do with existentiality, which is the third dimension of the care structure. Okay, so existentiality, remember this, is uh, Heidegger's way of talking about authenticity. Okay, so the opposite of what we just got done uh, talking about. So the question is, what is, what does authentic being toward death start to look like. And here's his way of saying it. Death is Dasein's own most possibility. Being toward this possibility discloses to Dasein its own most potentiality for being, in which its very being is the issue. Now, uh, I'm not sure if you're yet fluent enough in Heidegger ease to be able to sort that out. So. Um, Maybe the middle sentence is the most important one. Being toward this possibility discloses to Dasein, in other words, it reveals to us our own most potentiality for being. Okay, so we, we have a linkage here between uh, authentic being toward death and authenticity in general. So let me uh, try to make this a little bit more accessible to you. It's like, uh, you know, you'll only, uh, you'll only be compelled to begin to live a deeply powerful and authentic existence insofar as you realize that you're here in a very temporary and transient and mortal way. Unless you really feel and know that at some point, and it's an indefinite point, you're going to die. You'll never have the proper impetus to live an authentic life. Well, why is that? Because until you really know your mortality, you can always put off living authentically to some point in the future. It's only when you realize that there are not an infinite number of moments like that out there in your future that it lends authenticity a certain kind of urgency. So, and the fact of the matter is none of us really know when our moment is going to come. Like it could be, we like to think it's going to be many decades away, but maybe or maybe not. Like that's probably really evident since we're doing this video in the middle of the coronavirus. Like, like it can take you at any and all points, whether you have the coronavirus or not, is a very derivative question, incidentally. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, we live in a very fragile and unpredictable state with respect to our mortality. So uh, what this really amounts to, authentic being toward death, is that the, the time to, be, to live authentically is always now. You get it? Because no moment in our future is guaranteed other than the moment now. All right? So you can't really put off, when you realize that you're born to a mortal condition, you can't infinitely put off the urgency of at least having a few authentic moments in your lifetime every now and then. And the fact of the matter is there's only one moment that's guaranteed with respect to that, and that's this moment now. I mean, while you're watching this, okay? Like maybe you're munching some popcorn and decide, oh, I get to munch popcorn and listen to, to Dr. D at the same time. That's what some of my students call me. And uh, how, 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 that sound effect of you munching popcorn and watching Dr. D. But if that's what you're doing, that moment is the moment to begin to live authentically because no other moment is guaranteed to you. Getting it? Putting it off is an illusion for that reason. It's a probabilistic game. It may or may not happen that way that you can choose to live authentically later in your life. It may not happen that way. So really, the only time to live authentically is now, even as I'm making this video, and the same is true for me too. Okay, so here we see an intimate relationship between authentic being toward death and authenticity in general. I already said that. Uh, so it's only insofar as we thoroughly realize that we're mortal beings that living out our deepest possibilities can gain a kind of urgency and priority in our lives. Okay, so and most of your notes are just sort of repeating what I already said. I just realized that. So let me cycle down a little bit. Okay, so uh, the anxiety of facing the possibility of the impossibility of Dasein, in other words, that your 
existence may at some point become radically impossible in the most personal and definite of ways, uh, your capacity to endure that anxiety is actually integral to what will drive you into authentic existence. All right. So anxiety and your capacity to, to live through your anxiety and move through your anxiety and be informed by your anxiety is actually integral to your authenticity. All right, so it's not something, you, there's a price to pay for authentic existence, might be a, one way of saying that. Okay, so uh, moments like this have the effect of, here's how he describes it, wrenching Dasein away from its lostness in the they. So when you feel that very cold and intimate impress of death upon your skin as you move from moment to moment, which perhaps sometimes happens in your life, it can have the effect of pulling you out of what may be your habitual lostness, your disorientation in all of the, the razzle-dazzle and show business of the they. Right? Your temptation just to, com to conform and have that be the sum total of your life. Your temptation just to be a nice, obedient slave and have that be the sum total of your life. Encountering your mortality can be powerful enough to pull you out of all of that, to yank you out, to wrench you out of all of that, and at the same time um, begin to invite you to lay claim to what you really are in this world, okay? To your deepest possibilities, which are integral to your unique and unduplicatable participation in the riddle of existence, all right? So, um, anticipating your death. At first it seems like, well, that's such a goth type thing to do. Well, really, it's a human thing to do, okay? We don't normally do it, but it's ultimately a human thing to do. Um, you know, it can have a way of reorienting all of your values and what you allow to fill your consciousness, you know? Like, if you, if you really feel the urgency of your mortality, you might not be quite so consumed with the imbecility that the world continually offers you as something to fill your mind with and fill your awareness. Now, you might become less of an imbecile. And I know that's, that's a horrific nightmare for certain sectors of our social order that you might become less idiotic, but like that might be part of the effect of it, you know? So, well, you could do worse, all right? So along with this shift, like if you were to shift your life, comes a new kind of freedom. And here's Heidegger's summary. Anticipation of death, okay, remember in the last video we talked about the difference between expecting death and anticipating death, okay, so anticipation of death reveals to Dasein its lostness in the they self. Like when you really encounter your personal mortality, it can show you how lost you've been all along in the they, in the herd mentality of things, and brings Dasein face to face with the possibility of being itself, of living your life, okay? Primarily unsupported by concernful solicitude, but of being itself rather in an impassioned freedom toward death. A freedom toward death. A freedom which has been released from the illusions of the they and which is factical, certain of itself, and anxious. Okay, so that's a direct quote out of Being in Time. Now, part of what I wanted to do to put a cap on this treatment of, first of all, authentic being toward death, and I guess more generally, uh, Heidegger's rendering of death in terms of the care structure, and even more generally yet, uh, our treatment of Heidegger's work Being in Time, would be to read to you uh, a, a passage. I'm going to do a dramatic reading of a passage. And this passage is from a book that uh, back in the day uh, when I was a college student and so young and naive and full of all kinds of illusions and filling my moment with the moments of my life uh, so wildly. This was one of the books we passed around. It's by this guy, Carlos Castaneda. It's called Journey to Ixland. It's the third book in the series that he wrote. He wrote like a dozen or ten, ten or a dozen, somewhere around there. Anyhow, the point is that, um, let me do a setup for this reading. So this is going to be about a conversation by the two main characters in the book. Uh, one of the main characters is the author, 
so his name is Carlos, and the other one is uh, Don Juan, all right? So um, this Don Juan character is a, uh, a shaman, all right, from Mexico. So a shaman is a, a kind of um, uh, uh, a medicine man, you might say, like a medicine man or uh, character, okay, among the Native American tribes in Mexico. Okay, so this, this Westerner, this Western type character and the shaman are having this conversation. And this is a section entitled The Last Battle on Earth. Okay, so let me get my reading glasses, change my glasses here so I can see a little bit better. This is what happens when you get older and you have to confront your being toward death a little bit more directly. Okay, so um, Perhaps I should put it in a different way, Don Juan said. Okay, so this is the shaman character about to speak. What I recommend to you is to notice that we do not have any assurance that our lives will go on indefinitely. I just said that change comes suddenly and unexpectedly, and so does death. What do you think we can do about it? I thought now this is the author speaking. I thought he was asking a rhetorical question, but he made a gesture with his eyebrows, urging me to answer. To live as happily as possible, I said. Right, but do you know anyone who lives happily? My first impulse was to say yes. I thought I could use a number of people I knew as examples. On second thought, however, I knew my effort would only be an empty attempt at exonerating myself. No, I said, I really don't. I do, Don Juan said. There are some people who are very careful about the nature of their acts. Their happiness is to act with the full knowledge that they don't have time. Therefore, their acts have a peculiar power. Their acts have a sense of Don Juan seemed to be at a loss for words. He scratched his temples and smiled. Then suddenly he stood up as if he were through with our conversation. I beseeched him to finish what he was telling me. He sat down and puckered up his lips. Acts have power, he said, especially when the person knows that those acts are his last battle. There is a strange consuming happiness in acting with the full knowledge that whatever one is doing may very well be one's last act on earth. I recommend that you reconsider your life and bring your acts into that light. I disagreed with him. Happiness for me was to assume that there was an inherent continuity to my acts and that I would be able to continue doing at will whatever I was doing at the moment, especially if I was enjoying it. I told him that my disagreement was not a banal one, but stemmed from the conviction that the world and myself had a determinable continuity. Don Juan seemed to be amused by my efforts to make sense. He laughed, shook his head, scratched his hair, and finally, when I talked about a, quote, determinable continuity, threw his hat to the ground and stomped on it. I ended up laughing at his clowning. You don't have time, my friend, he said. That is the misfortune of human beings. None of us have sufficient time, and your continuity has no meaning in this awesome, mysterious world. Your continuity only makes you timid, he said. Your acts cannot possibly have the flair, the power, the compelling force of the acts performed by a man who knows that he is fighting his last battle on Earth. In other words, your continuity does not make you happy or powerful. I admitted that I was afraid of thinking I was going to die and accused him of causing great apprehension in me with his constant talk and concern about death. But we're all going to die, he said. He pointed toward some hills in the distance. There's something out there waiting for me, for sure. And I will join it, also for sure. But <laughs> perhaps you're different, and death is not waiting for you at all. He laughed at my gesture of despair. I don't want to think about it, Don Juan. 
Why not? <laughs> it's meaningless. If it's out there waiting for me, why should I worry about it? I didn't say that you have to worry about it. <sighs> well, what am I supposed to do then? Use it. Focus your attention on the link between you and your death without remorse or sadness or worrying. Focus your attention on the fact that you don't have time and let your acts flow accordingly. Let each of your acts be your last battle on earth. Only under those conditions will your acts have their rightful power. Otherwise they will be, for as long as you live, the acts of a timid man. Is it so terrible to be a timid man? No, it isn't if you're going to be immortal. But if you're going to die, there's no time for timidity, simply because timidity makes you cling to something that exists only in your thoughts. It soothes you while everything is at a lull. But then the awesome, mysterious world will open its mouth for you, as it will open for every one of us. And then you will realize that your sure ways were not sure at all. Being timid prevents us from examining and exploiting our lot as men. It's not natural to live with the constant idea of our death, Don Juan. Our death is waiting, and this very act we're performing now in this video may well be our last battle on earth, he replied in a solemn voice. I call it a battle because it's a struggle. Most people move from act to act without any struggle or thought. A hunter, on the contrary, assesses every act, and since he has an intimate knowledge of his death, he proceeds judiciously, as if every act were his last battle. Only a fool would fail to notice the advantage a hunter has over his fellow men. A hunter gives his last battle its due respect. It's only natural that his last act on earth should be the best of himself. It's pleasurable that way. It dulls the edge of his fright. <sighs> You're right, I conceded. It's just hard to accept. It'll take years for you to convince yourself. And then it'll take years for you to act accordingly. I only hope you have time left. I only hope that we all have enough time left. In any case, this ends our treatment of Heidegger and uh, it also ends this video. So have as good a day as possible under the circumstances, especially because, you know, if you're real about it, this may be the last one. So live it for all it's worth, okay? Have a good day. And in this video, we're gonna take up that topic once again, but this time in light of the care structure, okay? So referring to something that we went over in one of the previous videos. So the care structure, remember, is one of Heidegger's way of ways of uh, characterizing what it is to be. I've got the wrong damn glasses on. Where are my right glasses? They are MIA.